Now, let me just share with you, since we're developing today a mentoring mindset, let me just share with you for a moment what mentoring is not. Um, It's not spending time together. It's possible to spend time with somebody and do no mentoring at all. I mean, it's possible to spend time with someone and just pass the time away. And and mentoring is also not uh, some kind of a a, a therapy. Uh, there's a difference between counseling and equipping. Uh, counseling is when I sit with you and we talk about your weaknesses and we try to fix those. And I think counseling is important, but that's not what mentoring is at all. Mentoring is like equipping. See, when I counsel you, I work on your weaknesses, but when I equip you, I work on your strengths. And the way to grow and build people is by equipping them. And so uh, mentoring is not just, you know, me counseling with you with your problems. I, that's not mentoring you. Uh, I, I want to equip you. I want to build into you and find your strengths and build on them. And by the way, mentoring is just not a one-way street. It's not where I just sit and talk to you and you say nothing. If I had an opportunity, we'd sit down together. I would teach a while, and then you could ask questions. You see, mentoring is is, is really a, a two-way street. And the word mentor is both a verb and a noun. So what that means is mentoring, if it's a verb, is something that I do. It, it, it's all about, na- uh, about action. So the verb says, this is what I do, and the noun says, this is who I am. So when you get a picture of a mentor, I, I want you to see that that. I am a mentor, and what I do is I mentor you. If you went into my office in my home, you would see a painting that I put in offices wherever I live. And and over the years, that painting has moved from one office to another office of mine. But it's a beautiful painting of of an older brother painting and a younger brother watching and observing very intently as the older brother is, is showing him how to do this. And I love it because it's a picture of, of mentoring somebody, um, mentoring somebody uh, that, that's young and, and pouring into their life. So uh, as you develop a mentoring mindset, I want you to ask yourself this question. Uh, is this what I do? Do I mentor people? If so, that's a verb. Is this who I am? I am a mentor. That's a noun. And uh, the reason I'm doing this mentoring lesson with you anyway is that we had a discussion uh, in my mentoring session with Johnny Cash, and and he was talking to me, and and he has such a mentoring mindset that when I thought about him and his hunger hunger to be mentored, I thought, I'm going to kind of pass off to you what I see in him. So let's get going. A mentoring mindset, number one, has a passion for growth. The only guarantee in your life or my life that tomorrow is going to get better than today is that we are growing today. That's the only guarantee that we have. And so a mentoring mindset is a person that says, I I, I not only want to grow, but I know I need people to help me grow. You see, it's one thing for me to say, well, I'll read good books and I'll kind of do this on my own. And you can. And by the way, I want you to do that. But for you to really develop your leadership potential and be successful like you want to be, you really need to have people walk into your life, speak into your life, interact with them, learn from their perspective and from their experiences. Wow. That's what you want. I can still remember I had an opportunity to be mentored by a great leader known in America as America's greatest coach, very successful in developing highly successful basketball teams. His name was John Wooden. And I remember I had an opportunity to to have one mentoring session with him. And I realized that my goal was to have the one mentoring session with him in such a way to impress him that he would ask me to come back again. And so he had written six books at that time. So over the next month, I read all six of the books. And out of his books, 
I wrote on a legal pad questions I wanted to ask him, and by the time I flew to Los Angeles, I had five pages of questions. We sat down to breakfast that day, and our session was to be just a, an hour and a half. So he looked at me, and after, I don't know, a few minutes of just kind of introductory small talk, he looked at me and he said, John, he said, do you have a, a question you'd like to ask me? I said, well, I sure do, Coach. I said, I have them in my briefcase. Can I pull them out? He said, sure. So I reached in my briefcase. I pulled out my legal pad, and the first page was full of questions. They looked at it. And he said, oh, my. He said, you have a lot of questions for me. And I said, well, these aren't all the questions. And I turned the second page and the third page and the fourth page, the fifth page, five pages of questions. He said, wow, we need to get started. And we did. We not only had a great breakfast, but then he asked me to go over to his place where he lived. And I stayed at his house until 4.30 that day. In fact, at 4.30, we had just finished the first page of questions. And he said, John, could you come back? You still have pages of questions that we didn't even get to. And I said, I sure can. And that began a 14-year-old, that began a 14-year mentoring relationship. Now, here's what I want you not to miss. I had a mentoring mindset. My mindset was basically, I need to ask him some questions and I have more questions than he can ask in one setting. So how do I, um, how do I distinguish myself so that he'll ask me to come back again? You see, people with a mentoring mindset, there's a, there's a hunger and a passion for growth that they have. I see it all the time in Johnny when he looks at me and I'm mentoring and he'll say, well, John, how, how can I get better? And, and then how can I improve my company? And, and oh, by the way, John, send me everything you have right now. Could you send me all that stuff? He's, he's so hungry to learn. Why? Because he has a mentoring mindset. The second characteristic of a mentoring mindset is that people that really want to be mentored, they continually desire to add value to other people. You see, we have a choice in life. We can either be a river or a reservoir. Now, you know, a reservoir, it, it holds water. A river releases water. We can either in our life take the things that we learn and hold it just for ourselves and be a reservoir, or we can say, everything I learn, I'm going to be like a river. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to pass it on to others. People with mentoring mindsets, they have a continual desire, a passion, just to add value to others. And so therefore, that passion, that desire, that, that what Napoleon Hill called the starting point of all great achievement, he said, is desire. That passion, that desire allows us to continue when, when times get tough, uh, not stop when other people really want to want to quit. And, and, and this is big, and I, I don't want you to miss it, because sometimes our progress and our growth and success is determined by what I call our price point. How much, what kind of a price will I pay to achieve what I want to accomplish? And, and many people, they stop their journey um, because they, they are unwilling to pay the price anymore. On my journey, uh, my desire for personal success uh, changed from I want to be highly successful to I wanted to help other people be successful. That was a big switch for me. I, I developed a mentoring mindset when I was more interested in your success than in my success. So when people ask me at 75, they'll say, John, what are your greatest accomplishments? And w would it be writing books? And, and I've written a lot of books. In fact, I've written more leadership material than any person who has ever lived in the history of the world. So when people say, is your greatest accomplishment writing books? I'd say, uh, no. Well, would they say, would your greatest accomplishment be the fact that you've spoken over 13,000 times around the world? And, and that's been good, but no, that's not my greatest accomplishment. How about, how about your honors and your recognitions? Well, they're nice, but... That's not my greatest accomplishment. Well, the fact that you founded seven different companies, well, that's good. 
but that's not my greatest accomplishment. How about the money that you have made? And I've made a lot of money. I've been very blessed. Well, okay, but that's not my greatest accomplishment. My greatest accomplishment has been in mentoring, in helping people learn and grow and develop what I call legs to my legacy. You see, even after I die and I'm gone, I won't be gone because I have taught people the principles and the values that I have lived, and they have legs, and they just they just they cheat, just keep helping and passing on the good news to other people. Number three, a mentoring mindset experiences personal success in the area that they mentor others. In other words, when you find a mentor, you want to find somebody that has been successful in the area that you're wanting to learn and in the area that you're wanting to grow. Wow. So I mentor basically in five areas. I mentor people in communication, teach them how to cast vision. I mentor them in leadership, teach them obviously how to lead and influence people. I mentor people in equipping how to build teams. Uh, that's big. I, you know, how, how do you, how do you transfer to others the principles that you know and and equip them and enable them and empower them. I, I mentor in attitude thinking, the mindset, how we think. And, and then I, I, I mentor people in the area of relationships. How, how can you connect? How can you relate well with people? Now, those are my five areas. And I, I share that with you because I mentor out of my success. Now, there are many things I'm not good at all. I mean, nobody ever asked me to mentor them to to become a, a ballet dancer. I, I don't I don't mentor ballet dancing because there's nothing ballet or dancing about me, okay? I'm fat and I'm clumsy. It doesn't work. Now, now the reason I'm teaching you that is, is the fact that when you have a mentoring mindset, you realize that you only mentor people in areas that you're highly successful yourself. And why is that? Because we teach what we know but we reproduce who we are. Number four, a mentoring mindset, uh, a, a, a way of thinking and mentoring is people with this mentoring mindset, number number four, uh, they pass on successes through proximity and consistency. In other words, for me to mentor you well, I have to be fairly close to you, maybe not geographically close, but through technology. I have to be speaking into your life quite a bit. And, and I have to be not only close in proximity, but I need to be consistent in, 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 in what I mentor. You see, mentorship is both caught and taught. And, and the catching part of mentoring determines on the person that's mentoring you. And that's why I say, who you learn from is as important as what you learn. You see, mentoring has a kind of a twofold uh, impact. Uh, I, I learn information. I, I learn leadership, et cetera, from, from being mentored. But I also, from the person that mentors me, I catch their spirit. I catch their heart. There's something contagious about that, that catching part, okay? You see, when somebody is teaching me, they're teaching what they know. But, but what, what, when I'm around them, I'm not, only, I'm not only hearing what they know, I'm catching who they are. When I talked about John Wooden, he was such a, a great man, and he inspired me. You see, big men make you feel bigger. And every time when I would leave him, I would go out to hit the parking lot outside of his condo, and, and when I would get to the car, I would turn around, and there I would look at him. He would always be standing on his porch with his hand in the air, and he's and a big smile on his face, and he's waving goodbye to me. That there was something about the man that I just absolutely caught his spirit. And so, great mentors—they're they're contagious in 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 sharing and giving and. And you 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 become a little bit of, of of who they are, and you you do it together. When when people want to be mentored by me, I I basically say, well, you need to go on a trip with me. 
the other day, Johnny Cash and I were talking, and 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 I said, Johnny, you you, you need to go on a trip with me. He's going to go with me uh, very soon on a, on a, on a trip, and we're going to be together, and he's going to be able to see my vision because he's going to watch it before his own eyes, and and I'll be able to kind of do show and tell with him in that process. People with a mentoring mindset, that's that's how they think. Number five, a mentoring mindset uh, possesses the quality of, of humility. Um, this is very essential. Humility is so key to a, a leader's life. You know, Bill Gates said success is a lousy teacher because it makes people think that they cannot lose. When we're highly successful, there are times when we begin to think that that we're always going to win, that uh, nobody can touch us or hurt us, and and, and this is not true. And and one of the reasons why humility is huge is because it it helps center us. It it makes us solid. Success alone will, will make us a little delusional after a while. So I always tell people, keep success and failure together. Keep them right beside each other. I need to keep them together because they complement each other. In my success, when I have failure beside me, I learn humility. And in my failures, when I have success beside me, I learn resiliency. And resiliency gets me back up when everyone else quits and is tired and humility in my success makes me teachable and keeps me having a, a what I would call just a heart to really learn. I have found that humility is a very important quality for people to embrace. And so many times in, in like direct marketing companies, all we talk about is our successes and I want you to be very successful. Of course I do. And there've been so many that are successful in your company But I tell people all the time, you don't talk enough about your failure. You see, if I was in your business, I would not only talk about my wins, I'd talk about my losses. I would talk about the times that I didn't recruit somebody or that I recruited the wrong person. And and why do I do that? Because when I talk about my successes, I inspire people. But when I talk about my failures and have a sense of humility, I impact them. They, They look at me and they say, wow. Look how successful he is, and yet he's had these losses, he's had these misses, he's had these failures. Yes, yes, I have. That is very, very true. Number six, what I have learned also is that values, if you have a mentoring mindset, uh, you are always looking for people to have what I call values capacity. And and, and 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 you encourage that them to to have good values, and you encourage them to reach their potential. Great mentors are always wanting to improve themselves, and great mentors are always wanting to improve others. You see, we we judge ourselves by our potential, but others judge us by our performance. And, and what you got to do is you kind of close that gap between my performance and, and and my potential. John Wooden, back to my mentor, who was a great basketball coach, he would watch players at, in during practice not always give him 100%. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they were tired. Maybe they had an exam last night. I don't know. Maybe their girlfriend broke up with them. I don't know. But, but instead of giving 100%, they're only giving 80%. And John Wooden would come to them and put his arm around them, and he would say to them, a little tired today, aren't you? Yeah, coach, I'm a little tired. You're not giving me 100%. No, 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 probably 80. Okay. And then he would say to them, here's what I want you to understand. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I only give 80 today, but tomorrow I'll make up for it. Tomorrow I'll give 120. And he said, I want you to know, you can't give 120%. The best you can ever give is 100%. And anything less than that, you lose it forever. So you never make up tomorrow what you didn't do today. He was trying to stretch them as a mentor to reach their capacity, to to get to the level where really they could achieve great things. I wrote a book called No Limits a few years ago. And in that book, it says that if you want to reach your greatest potential, three things have to happen. 
you have to be self-aware. You have to be aware of yourself because you can't grow yourself unless you know yourself. Mm. You, you can't fix something that you don't know is broken. And so self-awareness is essential to the capacity of, of people reaching their potential. And then giftedness is so important. The more gifted you are, uh, the more strengths that you have, obviously, the, without any question, the more successful you'll be. And, and, and then it's, it's the choices. It's the choices that you would make. And, and so whatever my capacity is today, that's what my potential is tomorrow. And so I sit down and I help people understand there are different areas that you need to be stretched in. You need to be stretched mentally, emotionally. You, you've got more capacity for energy, for relationships, for leadership. I, I just read the other day that people only hit about 40% of their capacity. Wow. So great mentors, they try to help you to maximize the potential that you have. Finally, the last thing I want to say about having a mentoring mindset is that um, if you really want to have a successful mentoring relationship with a person, you have to have very clear upfront expectations. And, and what that means with is if I sit down with you and I'm going to mentor you, we're going to start off well because I'm going to give clarity to what we're trying to accomplish. I had a mentor one time who said, John, have an understanding so there's not a misunderstanding. This is what I'm talking about. So if I were to sit down with you and we were to begin this mentoring relationship together, um, I would say we need to have some upfront expectations of what this mentoring relationship looks like. So I would have what I call we expectations. We means you and me, both of us. And, and what that would be is the fact that we both have an understanding. We both agree that as we go into this mentoring relationship, this is what we want. And, and what we would agree on it would be things like, if we get together, um, we, will, we will maintain what I call an ROI, a return on an investment agreement. And what I mean by that is the fact <clears throat> that if I mentor you it's got to be a win for you, but it also has to be a win for me. It, it, you don't continue a mentoring relationship when one person wins and the other person loses. Relationships don't last long that are one-sided. And so we we have this we have this upfront expectation that we will make each other better. I'm looking at you as I mentor you, and and I'm saying I I expect to make your life better. And but I also expect from you, even though I'm mentoring you, I expect my life to be greatly enhanced also. So we have what I call we expectations. And then we have what I call you expectations. And, and, and these are what I expect from you. And, and so if you're going to mentor me, uh, here, here's what I expect from you, okay? And, and, and part of those expectations are like, I, I, I expect you to come early and be ready in our mentoring time. And, and I expect you to earn my time. How do you earn my time? By growth and improvement. So I expect there to be growth in this relationship. I, I expect you to do more than just learn. I expect you to improve. And by the way, another expectation I have for you is I expect you to mentor someone else when I'm done mentoring you. In fact, I never began a mentoring relationship with anybody without having an agreement that when I'm done mentoring them, you guess it, they mentor someone else. If that doesn't happen, we just don't have a mentoring relationship. I expect you to reproduce yourself. I expect you to be a river, not a reservoir. And then they, there are some expectations that you would have of me, just like I expect you to meet these expectations. You could look at me as your mentor and say, well, John, here's what I expect from you. And, and what I would tell you is if I mentor you is I would tell you, uh, first of all, I will be a safe person for you to share that you can share with me. And um, I, I won't tell others that I'm your friend. I only want what is best for you. And I think that the foundation of a mentoring relationship is security and safety. 
I would also say to you that I'll make myself available. I'll do my very best to to be available to you when you when you need to talk or you know when I, that doesn't mean I'm always available but but I'll do my best. We can set up appointments for sure. And that I also promise you in this relationship that I will give you my best. I, that I I really will. That I'll give you my best. That you you'll never get just a part of me. You'll get all of me. And that I will look out for your best interest. You know, Mark is the CEO of the John Maxwell Enterprise. And um, Mark was sharing with me that that during this crisis time that I'm, I'm, I'm mentoring him a little bit differently. And I thought, oh, that, that's kind of interesting. And so I kind of asked him, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, John, he said, you're mentoring me a lot on, on perspective because uh, how, we, how we view things is how we do things. And he said, uh, you're really helping me to to, to see a, a, a bigger picture than what the crisis is. Because remember this, crisis has a tendency to uh, reduce the picture. It has a tendency for us to begin to go inward and say, oh my, it's happening to me, and it's probably the worst thing that's ever happened, and nobody's probably ever gone like this and gone through this before. And so Mark said, John, you're just constantly keeping a, a big picture perspective during the crisis for me. He said, secondly, uh, you're just helping me with creativity. And, and the creativity is a fact that we've all had to change. A business is not as usual. In fact, for some businesses, not, period. So how do we get creative and, and what do we do when we can't do business as usual? So he said, you're helping me with the creativity. And then he said, thirdly, you're helping me balance realism and optimism. And, uh, you know, it, re- realism without optimism is so discouraging that um, – that we, we instead of leading together, we're going to have a wake together. And, and, and optimism without reality is pie in the sky. And, and there's that that's a, that's not even that's not even right for a leader to do that. In the, in the fact of um, you you have to give people a, 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 not only a, a, a hope, but you also have to help them. And, and the hope is in the optimism, but the help is in the realism. And, and so he said, "You're helping me with that balance there." And then he said, what's probably biggest difference is you're, you're, you're less instructive in your mentoring right now and you're just more available. In other words, I'm just basically saying, Mark, this phone is, call me at any time. Whatever comes up, I'm just here to help you. And, and so I almost, I almost called this lesson mentoring um, during a crisis. And then I thought, you know what, that's a little too small. I, I've got to get a little bit bigger here. Um, we are mentoring right in a crisis. I'm mentoring you today in a crisis. But there's a bigger picture there that not only will help us today in the crisis, but will help us tomorrow or when we're when we're out of this. And so um, I, I'm just kind of excited about this lesson. I just developed it for you, and, and I hope it adds value to you because there are four questions that you want to ask yourself to maximize mentoring in, in the relationship that you either have with people that you're mentoring or the person that's mentoring you. Here are the questions. Number one, who mentors me? That's very important. It's not only what they say, but who says it. Now, all four of these questions I'm going to come back and teach on. Number two, when do they mentor me? And the reason, obviously, that question is there is because um, timing is very important. And and there are times when we're more receptive to mentoring than others. For example, during a crisis, we're much more receptive to what leaders have to say when we're in trouble than what we, what they have to say when we seem to be go, going along real well. Question number three is, is how do they mentor me? I'm very excited about sharing this with you because I think this is meat and mentoring that very seldom any of us ever get. So I went inside myself a lot on this and I just said, okay, how do I do it? And, and intuitively, how do I share with you how to really um how to, how to really mentor people to get a maximum return for that person that you are sharing with. And then question number four, how do I maximize the mentoring? How do I maximize the mentoring if I'm mentoring you? How do I max, maximize the mentoring if you're mentoring me? In other words, after, after we're done, we're not done. And, and that's the thing I think so many people never realize in success. They, they think that, okay, I, I just finished that. And, and um, <laughs> They don't really um, appreciate nor value nor understand the uh, return on what I would call sustained thinking. In other words, uh, when everybody else is done thinking, if you'll stay with that thought a little bit longer, it, the odds are very high that you're going to get a better thought than the people that just kind of said, well, we're done. Anyway, so those are the four questions, and and um, I, I think that 
this is going to be helpful. And so thanks for being with me. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope I help you. I hope you pass it on to others. So let's go to question number one, who mentors me? Um, I want to give you some, I, I want to give you some questions to ask in picking the person or making sure that the person who mentors you is the right person. Because you see, there, there is the information that's given in mentoring. I mean, the knowledge the, um, that's passed on. But, but the reason that who is very important is that there's also a spirit in mentoring. There's, a, there's, a, there's an attitude. There's a soul in mentoring that really uh, has us to stop and say, it's not only what I'm learning from this person, in fact, to be honest with you, I think every person is my teacher. And so whenever I'm with anyone, uh, no matter who they are, no matter where I am, I'm always in a, a in kind of a student mode because I know they have something that if I'm listening, asking enough questions, they're going to teach me. So so that that's for everybody. I mean, everybody can be a, a teacher to us. But, but when it really comes to somebody mentoring us, that who question is really an important question because... That there's the, uh, the contagiousness of mentoring is more in the spirit of the person that mentors you than in the words that they give you. So let, here, here are the questions. Very simple. Uh, let's go. Uh, when, when you're you know picking somebody to mentor you, um, ha- have they been successful? Okay. Uh, and just to be honest with you, I, I really don't have much desire to have somebody mentor me that that hasn't excelled in the area that they're mentoring me in. Because I want them to be better, farther, smarter than I am. By the by, the question, uh, have they been successful? Just put the word experience there, okay? Because that's an experience question. I mean, that's somebody that has had a, a track record of, of success under the belt. Question number two, are they right now successful? Now, this is a little picky, but I think it needs to be mentioned because um, just like you put experience by the first question, put relevance by this. If they're successful right now, there is a relevance that they have that they wouldn't have if they had been there and done that. I, I, I Been there and done that is the experience side. Been there and doing it is the relevance side. You got it. Question number three, have they been tested and have they passed? In other words, have they passed the crisis test? Because you really don't know if the principles and the values that you talk about really have strength and power and stability until you've been tested with it. And beside, by the way, beside the, that question, you know, have they been tested? Have they passed that test? Put the word wisdom. And the reason for that is wisdom comes out of crisis and what we've learned from it. Wisdom doesn't come out very seldom of the easy days we have. Wisdom comes, it's forged out of that 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 crisis that we go through, that through that, it's more than what we know. It's what we experience. It's all put together. That's where you get wisdom. Question number four, are they continually growing? I love this question. In fact, this is a big question for me on people that are mentoring me. I I really want people to not only talk to me about what they have learned, I want them to talk to me about what they are learning. The difference is when they tell me what they've learned, I get experience. When they tell me what they're learning, I get passion. So this is a this is a passion question. I, I want to I want to be mentored by a person who is doing it right now and, and they're growing right now. And there's something about the contagiousness of that in a mentoring role that is absent with a person that has grown, but they stop growing. Uh, in fact, I can still remember a, a very important mentor in my life, very important mentor. I can still remember the day where where we sat down and we were in a mentoring session and all of a sudden the realization, it just it just hit me like a brick. I, it just hit me. I'm, we're having this mentoring session and I look at this person that I greatly love who has helped me in incredible ways and I said to myself, they've stopped growing. They're repeating themselves. I, I, I was sad all afternoon. Because I had just outgrown my mentor. And that I just never wanted to do that. I always wanted that person to be ahead of me, before me, bigger than me. So that's a great question. Are, are, are they continually growing? And, 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 and the next one, are they emotionally grounded? 
I, I not only want somebody that has all the qualifications I've talked to, but I want somebody that's solid. And the reason I, I ask the question, are they emotionally grounded? Because I'm giving you one word by the question. That word's perspective, by the way, is, is because dysfunctional leaders, and, and we're getting more dysfunction in leadership and in our culture all the time, all the time. Dysfunctional leaders lead out of their issues instead of out of a good perspective. You show me a, 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 a person that is emotionally challenged and dysfunctional, and I'll show you a person who leads according to what their needs are, not according to what the big picture is. So are they emotionally grounded? Um, question, question number, uh, I don't know, six, which one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, six. Quick question number six. Um, are they my sponsor? Now, I'm going to have to explain that one because um, there's, a, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A mentor is pouring into my life and helping me, but a sponsor is doing more than pouring into my life and helping me. They're backing me up. They're in my corner. They fight my fights for me. Uh, the, the word by sponsor is the word commitment. I've had a lot of mentors. I've had very few sponsors, but I've had a few. In fact, about a year and a half ago, Tom Phillippe Sr. passed away, and he was a huge sponsor from the time I was 33. I mean, for, for about almost, not quite, 40 years of my life, he was my sponsor, which meant when I was a young leader, he, he carried weight for me. He, he paved the way for me. He was the John the Baptist. He, he fought for me when I wasn't there. He was always in my corner, and, and he was more than a mentor. He was a, 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 he was a sponsor. He, said, he, he basically said, that's my boy. And and you can't touch him, and and I'm going to protect him, and and I, I'm going to serve him, and and I'm going to I'm going to constantly look out for him, and if he's with me or if he's not with me, it doesn't matter. It's my boy. We're all fortunate if we can have not, a few sponsors in our life. I, I've been very blessed. I've had a few, not a lot, but boy, the few I've had made a big difference in my life. The last question goes back to really why I ask who is mentoring me, and that this question's huge, and that is, uh, do they have do they have a greatness that's bigger than their work? Now, you don't hear about this when, when we talk about mentoring. This is seldom ever discussed, but I'm telling you, it's absolutely essential. This is going back to who mentors me. Most of the other questions I've asked really uh, are, are questions that we quite understand. But this one, um, that their greatness is bigger than their work. I'm talking about, what, what, what word do I use for that one? Their their um their spirit, uh, the persona maybe, but I think persona gets too wrapped up with charisma, and I don't like that because that's not where we're going here. Let me, let me. I think I can illustrate it maybe better than even give you the right word. I had the privilege for about twelve years to be mentored by John Wooden. Life changing, life changing. The, if if I had to list mentors, he would be at the top of the list. And he, he taught me incredible things. I, I just live every day principles he taught me in leadership. I remember the first time when I left him after a mentoring session, and, I, and, and he, he was in a little condominium, and we went down the elevator. I went down the elevator. He stayed in this condo, and I went to a little parking garage, and then the visitors parked out on the outside. And so I'm, I'm walking in my car, and I'm just about to open the door of my car, and I just had this intuitive feeling to turn around, and I turned around, and I looked up, and, and, and on, the, on the little balcony where, where Coach Wooden lived, he was standing there, and he was watching me the whole time. And he was waiting for me to turn around. He didn't, he didn't call my name out. He didn't even say anything. He was just standing there. He was watching a person that he had just spent four hours with. And I turned around, and I looked up, and I'll never forget, he had that incredible smile of his and, and that wave. And I got in the car, and I said, I, I was with a great teacher today, but I was with a greater man than I was a great teacher. Wow. That's huge. That's mentoring that changes life. So, okay, maximizing mentor, who mentors me? That's, that's question number one. Now, now, when do they mentor me? Great question. If you were in my home office, um, just to the uh, 10 feet from where I sit at my desk, there, there, there's a, a couple shelves of books. And those books are books that have marked my life. They are there on purpose because at some time in my life, I read them. They marked me. They, they changed me. 
They, uh, they transformed me. Th- these were life-changing books for me. I mean, they're not a lot. I really haven't counted them, but I'm going to guess 25. And, and I've, I've probably read 10,000 books. I've read a lot of books. But, but these were books that marked me. And, and every once in a while, I'll just go over and pull one out and sit down and look at it for a little bit. And, and it's just, it's just, it's just a, a comforting feeling because they, they have been great friends of mine. Now, here's what I want you to say. All those books over there that marked my life, there's one word that keeps all of them on the shelf together. Because, and that word is timing. And here's what I want you to, I, I want to make sure we really catch this. I pick up those books now and I read them. And, and, and in fact, sometimes I look and I say, well, that wasn't that great of a book. I mean, it's a good book, but wow, that's over in the mark me section. But then I take myself back to when I read the book. And here's what, all those books have one thing in common, timing, timing. You see, I read that book when that book spoke to right where I was in the timing of my journey. And so it was a great book. Maybe not because it was a great book. It was a great book because the timing was right. That book was giving me what I needed for right now. That's why when we ask the question, when do they mentor us? That's a great question. Because sometimes you could hear the mentor say the same words, but the timing wasn't quite right, so they wouldn't have the same impact. You know, crisis, the reason I'm talking about it now is is we're in a crisis. I think this is a huge time to mentor people because I think they're receptive to leadership. I think they're receptive to a crisis. And and, and crisis, what does it do? It moves people. It changes people. It takes people out of their, their, their comfort zone. In fact, that's one of the reasons I told Mark, I'm available to you. I'm just close to the phone. Why? Because he's leading in uncharted territory. He's, the, the waves are moving on him. And, and, and so I, availability is huge. But, but timing is so key. In fact, that's, that's, why, that's why we're doing these lessons here. This is a timing time. It, it, we're, we're all looking for answers. We're all looking as, as leaders for uh, uh, resources. I mean, the things I'm giving you, I'm assuming you're not only applying them to your life, but you're passing them on. That's why the John Maxwell Enterprise is making this available to you. It's, it's a timing issue. When do they mentor? Here's what I do know. This, is, this could be in a teaching itself. I'm just going to give you the quote because i got to move on. Most of the things we want, but we don't have them. We want them, but we don't have them. Most of the things we want but don't have are just outside our comfort zone. Trust me on that. And so what does a crisis do? It moves us. And it sometimes moves us out of the comfort zone. That's one of the benefits of a crisis. If you're getting moved out of your comfort zone, if you have a good perspective about that and you're willing to learn out of that comfort zone and you're willing to uh, uh, look for opportunity out of that comfort zone, there are some good things that happen. So who mentors me? That's the contagiousness of of the spirit of the person. Uh, when when do they mentor me? Uh, timing is so important. What's what, what's the statement? Uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Okay, that that's just, you got it, you got it. Question number three. How do they mentor me? In this part, I'm going to really talk about, I, I, I'm going to talk about um, mentoring in a crisis, okay? Um, this, this one's probably the most crisis-related of, of the three questions. So, so how do I mentor people right now? Number one, they give me perspective. During a, a crisis time, what that mentor will do more than anything else is they'll help us continually see the whole picture. Because in a crisis, we see our picture. And they constantly are expanding us. Because what do leaders do? Leaders see more than others see. They see before others see. So they see this whole big pic- picture. It's what I did um, a few weeks ago. Perhaps you're with me. We had over a million people with us. But it's what I did a few weeks ago when... Um, when I talked about leading during a crisis, and what did I, one of the things I did is I, I said a crisis is quite common. Now, I wasn't trying to undermine or underestimate the, the, the coronavirus. I wasn't doing that at all. But what I was trying to do is to help everybody understand that this isn't the first crisis, won't be the last crisis. It's not even the biggest crisis. It's just a crisis. 
But the tendency is that he, for emotions to rule during a crisis to where we think that what we're in right now is the worst thing that's ever happened, and it's never happened before, and it's never been so bad, and it's just not true. My good friend Simon Sinek, we were texting back and forth the other day, and um, he said, John, listen to this, and he sent me a, a, a great podcast. And, and basically on it, he, he was talking to his team. And one of the things he said is, he said to them, these are not unprecedented times. In other words, I want you to know, Simon saying to his team, don't ever think that like this is the biggest, worst thing that's ever happened and I happen to be living during it and I'm right in the middle of it. You see, when we're in a crisis, the the number one question people are asking right now is, uh, is, how do we get through this? You know, my gosh, how long is it going to last? How am I going to get through of it? Am I going to make it? See, the question shouldn't be, how am I going to get through this? The question should be, how am I going to get better because of this? How am I going to improve? When the crisis is over, do I come out better or do I come out bitter? And, and, and uh, wow, that's, that's a huge, huge issue. And, and So I want to get perspective in the crisis. I want to make sure that we have reality, but we also have hope. Alan Malawi, a wonderful friend, was the CEO that turned Ford Motor Company around. I mean, it's an incredible story. I think it's called the book, The American Dream. It's a, I read it. It's a a thick book, but it's an incredible story. And when they were bleeding billions of dollars and, and, and Ford was in trouble, and, and there was a lot of emotion, and, and they, were, they were in a huge crisis. And, and Al Malawi's calming influence through all of this, I mean, every day they're, they're checking to see where they are, and are, are they going backwards still, or are they starting to slow the tide down? And, and, and his, his phrase he continually used was, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to make it. It's okay. It's It's okay. Well, all Alan Malai was doing is he, he was just giving perspective. He was not only giving perspective, he was showing perspective in a crisis. So how, how do they mentor me? Well, the, the first thing, they give me perspective. N- number two, they share out of their personal life. Now, this one I, I just am passionate about, and I want to do a good job. I hope I do a good job for you. It, what, what I'm saying here is when I talk about they share out of their personal life, um, most mentoring is telling, where I, if I'm mentoring you, I sit down and you would maybe ask questions and I tell you what I've learned and, and those type of things. And, and it, it, kind of telling is where you sit down and I tell you what I think you need need to know. Sharing, and, and we're talking about sharing out of our personal life. Sharing is where instead of you sit down and I kind of tell you what I think you probably need to know. If I share with you, I say, you know what, Just here, 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 sit right beside me, here, sit right beside me, Okay. And I want you to sit beside me because I want you to experience what I experience. I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to see what I see. Um, I want you to watch me as we're in this crisis. It's it's the power of proximity to a great sense. But but sharing basically is inclusive. It's not, I know something you don't know I'm going to teach you, although mentoring has that, no question about it. It's kind of like I'm going to let you on the inside. I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you see me. It's 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 what I tell communicators all the time. Do you want and leaders? Do you want fans or friends? If I want fans, I'm going to constantly make sure that my level of excellence is so far above yours that you just can applaud me, but you can say, "Wow, that man is amazing," but I can never achieve what he achieves. That's the kind of leader that wants fans. If I want friends, I'm going to walk slowly through the crowd. I'm going to have this sharing spirit. I'm going to basically say. Come come with me. You, you can see me. You can see me in, in my strengths. You can see me in my weaknesses. You can see me with my questions and doubts. You can see me when I'm strong. Just, just, just here, sit beside me. Sit beside me. That's powerful mentoring. And in this crisis, that, that example that you show people is just going to be huge in really developing them well. So when I have you sit beside me, there are three things I'm going to just make sure that you that you partake in this journey. One is um, the source of my strength. If you sit beside me, uh, I want you to see me uh, go to the source. Now, I, I'm gonna have to stop here for a moment and just say to you, to, you know this already, but I really always try to keep fairness with all of my friends because I love everybody unconditionally, everybody unconditionally. 
people that don't have my viewpoints, people that don't have my faith. It doesn't matter. You, you couldn't stop me from loving you if you tried. Okay, I love you unconditionally, but I am a person of faith. So if you were with me, I, I would take you to my source of strength. I, I would take you to the well that I go to where I draw the water. And, and for me, it, 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 it's, it's, it's my faith. It's my relationship with God. Every day I'm reading Psalm 112. And the reason I'm reading it is because it's fantastic. And I not only read it, but I pray it. And again, let me just say to you, let me just say to you, just close, you know, you know, you know, put your fingers in your ears. You don't want to hear this, but I'm only going to be here for a moment. My name's John. You know, you can trust me. I'm your friend. I mean, you always have been your friend, but 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 when you read scripture, it's wonderful. But when you pray scripture, you put yourself in 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 it. You put yourself in it. And I'm just going to t- just give me a moment because in Psalm 112, and I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read um, just a couple, three verses. When darkness overcomes me, now see, I'm praying this. I put myself into the scripture now. When darkness overcomes me, light will come bust, bursting in. I will be kind, merciful, generous, and fair as I conduct my business so that all goes well with me. I will not be overthrown by evil circumstances. God's constant care for me will make a deep impression on all who see it. And I do not fear bad news nor live in dread of what may happen, for I have settled in my mind that God will take care of me. And that's why I'm not afraid, but I can calmly face my foes. I will give generously to those in need. My deeds will not be forgotten, and I shall have influence and honor. I love that I have settled in my mind that God will take care of me. That's my source of strength. In fact, when, I'm, when I am with my beautiful friends that I dearly love, and, and they're not people of faith, sometimes I look at them and just say, I, I just wish you had my faith. I'm not trying to convert you. I just wish you had my faith. Because... Um, that's where my strength is. That's where my peace is. That's where that's where my joy is. I, I mean, if you have something that helps you, you want it to help others. And so anyway, I'm I'm done. I'm done with that. I'm just saying to you that in mentoring in tough times, as they sit beside you and you're sharing, you, you got to let them know where your source is. And your source may not be God. It may not be Scripture. I, 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 but, but 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 what's your source? Where do you go for strength? Because you have to have a source that anchors and stabilizes you so you can do that for others. You cannot give what you do not have. Just can't do it. Um, The second thing that I want to do when I'm mentoring a person during a crisis is I want to share with them what I'm experiencing, my emotions. I want want to be raw with them, and, and that's why I want them beside me. See, if I teach them later, I may skip some of my negative emotions because can I tell you, for example, with the coronavirus, I was over in Israel when it started hitting the world and hitting the United States, and 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 my first my first emotion to this was anger. I I was just mad, and the reason I was angry is because I thought there's a lot of emotional people that are leading, and now the leaders are going to have to respond to a bunch of fearful people. Now I, I'm not saying that's the right perspective. It, it certainly is a, 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 a an emotional perspective, and it was a negative with me because I was angry about it. But but if you're beside me, I'm going to tell you, I'm anger. I, I'm, I'm angry about this. I, I don't like it. Uh, and then I got really frustrated because as I got back and, and everything began to cancel, all of a sudden, the next two and a half months, my schedule was all messed up. And, and I lost, I mean, I, I lost all kind of times when I could help people and add value to them. And you know, it was a, one of my losses was I, I was supposed to go to the Vatican at the end of this month, and uh, Pope Francis had given me the invitation to speak with him in, uh, on leadership, and, and we were have a master class with the Pope, and all that was gone. And so I, I was extremely frustrated, and I was I was disappointed. Okay, but but I had positive emotions too. I was invigorated. I mean, I don't mean this unkindly, but during a, a difficult time, the darkest time is when the leader goes touchdown. Hello, this is why I'm born. This is what I do. This is what I was born for this. So it's it's invigorating me because it, it keeps me in my leadership zone all the time. And and it, it 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 I have creative emotions because I know there's an answer, so I'm looking for that answer. And 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 I'm just well, I'm I'm grateful right now because because there, I have forced rest time and it's helped me with my health and and, and and I have a book on transformation, change your world that I've needed to write, and now I've got time to write it. So anyway. But, but let them sit beside you and let them feel the emotions that you're going through. 
They need to see that. They need to see your good days. They need to see your bad days. Remember, people don't want a perfect leader. They want an authentic leader. They'll connect with you. You, If you want to impress people, talk about your success. But if you want to impact people, talk about your your failures. They'll, they'll let, them, let them in the seat beside you. Let, let, them, let them be close to you at this time. So I, I, I'm going to share, you, share with you what my source is during difficult times. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to share with you what I'm experiencing emotionally during these difficult times, and the third thing I'm going to share with you is, is what I'm learning, because there are tremendous lessons to be learned, and I'm working real hard every day saying, okay, what am I learning? So when somebody comes and says, you know, they talk to me about a failure in your life, I care for them, so I listen to their failure. But honestly, as soon as they're done telling about the mess up they've had in their life, the question I have for them is, well, what did you learn? Because the value of failure is us learning something that changes us. So, you know, you know, I, I started putting some things down on my notes on, on what I'm learning. Uh, I'm, I'll just, I, I can't, I don't have time to give all of them to you, but let me just give a few of them. For example, a crisis will prioritize for us what we won't prioritize for ourselves. That's true. This, 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 this coronavirus has has taken all the stuff that we've been doing, and it's just very quickly said, okay, now what's really important? What's really important? I mean, whether it's going back to values and family, or or whether it's going uh, going back to to the relationships we have in life. I mean, what's what's really important? A, a crisis just moves us around, and all those priorities, some of those things that we thought was so important, we're realizing now that that wasn't that important. So if, if we don't prioritize our life, at the, then, then a crisis or something difficult has to come to kind of shuffle us around so we can look and say, what's really important to me? Another thing I'm learning is that uncertainty causes really uh, more, more stress than, than bad news. Um, you know, I give the analogy of going to the airport and wanting to catch a, a, a plane when, hey, when we could go to the airport and get a plane. And so you get there and you get to the gate and you realize the plane's late and you have maybe a connecting flight. And so immediately you ask yourself, can I still get on this delayed flight and make my connecting flight? And so for the make me, maybe the next 15 minutes, you're just kind of uncertain and your, your, your stress level goes up because you're not really sure this is going to take on time and it, it, everything's in the air. Everything's uncertain. You just don't know. Well, let's say they all of a sudden come over the intercom and, and they basically say, look, uh, this plane now is, is going to start even later than we thought, and so they give us a time. And, and the time they gave us, we realize, oh, okay, <laughs> that's horrible news. I, I'm not going to I'm not going to make that connecting flight. But you know, the stress level goes down when you know you're not going to make the connecting flight. The bad news is less stress on you than not knowing what's going to happen. Because now that the bad news has happened, you say, okay, now I've got to make alternative plans. It's back into my control. Uncertainty, what makes uncertainty so difficult for us is that it's out of our control. We, 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 we can't do anything about it. Another lesson that, that I, I'm just loving and, and learning and teaching is that respect is gained on difficult ground. It really is. If you're a leader... Uh, and you lead well during this crisis for your people. Can I tell you something? When you come out of that crisis, the respect they have for you will just heighten. Uh, the highest authority is not positional authority. It's moral authority. And moral authority is, is truly when you have been proven, tested, and, and you have done extremely well. After a while, you have an authority that's beyond any kind of legal ramifications. You have an authority that people just say, I follow that person because I, they've been tested, and I've watched them being tested. If, if if everything worthwhile is uphill, and it is, and it looks like this during a crisis, it's like this. Well, let me tell you something. If you can get through that crisis and lead through that crisis and help people get through that crisis, you, you're going to gain respect. You're going to come out of this with more respect from the people that you lead and and, and more more authority than you've ever, ever had. Uh, another lesson I'm, I'm just practicing every day is it's, it's a, okay, it's from the scripture, but it, it doesn't matter. It applies to you too. And that is give thanks in all circumstances. Boy, that's a relevant word, isn't it? Give, give thanks in all circumstances. It, it doesn't say give thanks because you're in a bad situation, but just give thanks because you're in it. Uh, in all circumstances, no matter what it is, because 
because it's going to, it, with the right perspective, it's going to make you and I better. Boy, a lesson I'm learning right now is a crisis lets me know that if, I, if my living and my talking match. You know, I, I write books, I teach, and I give principles out. But, you know, when a crisis comes, all those things I teach that just sound good that you write them down, they're getting tested now. I mean, are my values truly great values? It's going to be tested during the crisis. Are my principles and the truth that I teach and embrace, is it, is it real truth? Wow. Well, there are other things I have here, but, uh, you know, time's kind of getting away from me. And so it's, wow. Um, well, okay, I'll give you just one more, just one more. Now, this is personal. I, I probably shouldn't give it to you because I need to have time to teach on it. I don't have time to teach on it, but I, I'm going to just put it in as a thought for you. It's good to realize that we're not in control. And it's bad that a crisis has to remind us of that fact. What a crisis does is it humbles us. I know for a fact after 9-11, because literally after 9-11, that next Saturday, I did a I did a huge simulcast across America called America Praise, and I raised over six million dollars in five minutes for 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 that situation. And I put it through a uh, I, I put it through World Vision. I didn't put it through my nonprofit. I wanted to put it. I wanted to have a, a, a arm's length from it, so everybody know I'm not getting anything out of it myself. And so we raised six million dollars. And literally the next week, I'm in New York City, being led by the leaders of New York City because of what we had done. So I'm go, I'm going through. I'm going through these areas, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm seeing the smoldering and everything that's happening, and it's it's and so I'm watching. I'm I'm observing it. And in that process is why I'm watching it while I'm observing it. It's a, I, 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 there's a, there was a sense of humility among those New Yorkers like I have never seen before in my life. And I'm just telling you, it's good for me. It's good for you. It's, all, it's good for all of us to realize that we don't always have the answers. We're not quite as big as we think we are. We're not quite as important as we think we are. And that we need faith and we need relationships. And that we are our brother's keeper. These are just things that center us and get us back to basic good values that are valuable. Okay, um, let me just wrap this up with the last question, okay? We've asked three maximizing mentoring questions. Who mentors me? When do they mentor me? How do they mentor me? I hope this is really helpful to you. I'm enjoying teaching. I hope it's just, I hope it's applicable to where you are. Question number four is how do I maximize the mentoring? And so what I'm going to share with you is three things. And because of time, I don't really have a lot of time to get into this. Maybe on another time, I'll, I'll go deep in it. But I'm going to give you three words. And if you'll remember these three words and practice them, uh, you'll maximize every mentoring experience you have. The first word is preparation. The second word is reflection. And the third word is action. Preparation. All's well that begins well. You preparing before you meet the person that you're mentoring is going to make a huge difference in their lives. I remember the first time I had the opportunity to have a mentoring session with John Wooden. My question more than the other question was, will it be a good enough session that he will ask me to come back and do another session with him? I read every book that he had written. I wrote down questions for him on a legal pad, five pages of questions. When I flew out for a two-hour breakfast at his favorite breakfast place, we sat across each other in a booth. We had small talk for 10 or 15 minutes. He said, John, do you have any questions? I said, I sure do, coach. I reached in my briefcase. I put my legal pad on the table in front of him. He saw the whole page was full of questions. He looked at me and said, oh, my, you've come prepared. You've got a whole page of questions. Are those all for me? I said, well, yes, they are, but those aren't all the questions. He said, what do you mean? I turned to the second page. It was full. The third page, it was full. Fourth page, it was full. Fifth page, it was full. I said, I have five pages. I've got a lot of questions. You're going to really be able to help me. I know we can't get through all of them, but but can we get started? He said, well, let's get started right now. We got started right now. We left the breakfast table, went to his house by his invitation, and I left him at 4 o'clock that afternoon. And he looked at me and said, John, we're only through page one. You got four pages. Could we meet again? We sure can. Preparation. All's well that begins well. Reflection. All's well that ends well. I had five pages of questions. 
But at the end of that day, I had eight pages of notes. Now what do I do? Within 24 hours, I sit down and I take those notes and I begin to categorize those notes. Again, this is a whole teaching in itself. What do I need to, what do I need to apply? And, and I put all the application stuff I need to apply that he taught me there. And what do I need to, what do I need to, what do I need to, to change in my life? What did he say that I said, oops, got to do a U turn here. I was doing that wrong. Or, or maybe I hadn't even started. I mean, maybe I need to change from not going to going. And, and so I put all the C's, the, the change things together. And then, okay, what do I need to teach others? Okay, I put all the T things there. That, and so I now, ca- I, okay, these are my application. This is the things I change. These are things I teach. That's all reflection. Now you see, I've got a personal growth program. I, I'm going to take maybe number one A, number one C, number one T, and I'm going to practice that for a couple of weeks. And, and, and so now I'm, I'm which, which brings me to the third word, action. You see, there's no transformation. There's no change without action. So there you go. Those are the four questions. You got them. Now what you'll do with them is you'll increase them and make them better than I gave them to you. But I want you to go out and find somebody to mentor during this crisis or go sit at the feet of somebody that needs to mentor you and think of these four questions and start maximizing your time with people. Why? because you're important. And the more you maximize what you learn, the more you maximize how you can help other people. Well, my father was my main mentor and he just passed away on July 4th this year. He was 98. And, uh, you know, all my life he's been spoken into me. And so I was very blessed to have him. And then I've, I've had great mentors. I've, John Wooden, the, who coached UCLA, the last 11 years of his life, we were very, very close. and. And most of my mentors have been what I would call seasonal mentors. I, I needed them for a season because I was mm-hmm. going through something. And and I think we make a great mistake in mentoring when we think only one person can mentor me and I want only one mentor. And I, you know, I when people ask me to be their mentor, I say, no, I'm I'm not that good. I most things I don't I, I you don't want me to mentor you in most stuff. I'm not any good at it, you know. I'm only good in a few things. I'll mentor you in what I'm good, but you know, you don't need so I think it's having a maturity to understand that you need different mentors for different reasons and most of those mentors will be with you for a season and and that's good and and when you get through that season you go you know you you you're going to go into another season where you'll need another kind of mentor no doubt about it I love that that's a that's a great way to look at it you know a friend of mine just told me he's like I have three types of mentors I have the, the old wisdom, the 78-year-old Maxwells in my life that have built dynasties and been through all the ups and downs and have a lot of wisdom. And he's like, I have the lateral mentors that are kind of on the same journey that I'm at, similar stage in business or career or family or whatever. And then he's like, I have my younger mentors that are like in the hip and the know and the hustle and the, you know, and I, he's like, I have all sorts of mentors. And, and I like that. I do too. Just kind of seasonal of like, that's that's solid. What are your, what are your, yeah, and I, I I really like that. And I'm like, man, who are my young hip mentors? Even though I'm still fairly young, but I'm like, I don't know what's going on with TikTok and like Snapchat, and like you know, and I don't know what's going on, you know. And, and and I'm sure you've done all sorts of, you've been through all sorts of lawsuits, and you've been through sort of all sorts of different real estate deals, and I'm sure you've been through all sorts of business like ups and downs. And, you know, I, my father is an entrepreneur. And, you know, when you said your father, your first, uh, I would say 100% my dad as well has been That's good. my number one mentor. Mm-hmm. Like, That's good. Uh, blessed to have somebody in my life as well. So John was up there staggering. Oh, How wow. do I apply this one to leadership? <laughs> one of the funniest moments i can oh, ever remember was that moment what, what's been some of your what, what's been well i'll never memories? forget well first of all when, when when she said the word my hearing isn't a hundred percent in fact i have <laughs> hearing aids and when she said the word mark honestly i thought i misunderstood her <laughs> you ask her so, to say it again so, hey <laughs> let me let me define <laughs> stupidity stupidity is asking as I did, I looked at her and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm a little hard of hearing. Could you say the word one more time? And told and, her to slow down. Yeah, I, told her, <laughs> I, said, I said, can you? And she and did. Slow down a little more clearly <laughs> for me. And she, I'll never, and she leaned into me. And again, she said the F word. <laughs> and, and now I know what she has said. 
I also know she didn't mean it, but, but all I hear is that. And, and there are like a thousand people behind me. They were coaches. We were at a conference in the earlier years, and they all heard the same word that I heard. And, and there's about three minutes or three seconds, not minutes. It three felt seconds. Like three minutes. Yeah, I felt like of awkward <laughs> silence of where I'm saying, okay, what do I do with the F word? <laughs> and, and so about three seconds in, all of a sudden I went, I just, I just brought it ah! And I started laughing, and the place broke up. We and did. if you remember, for five minutes, we couldn't get them back, we together. Get I mean, back together. We'd start to do another uh, minute with Maxwell, and somebody would start laughing. We'd have to pull it back. It was truly one of the, yeah. well, unforgettable, but one of the most fun, funny moments of my entire yeah. life. You've had world leaders do Minute with Maxwell. You've had a good time. So 2011, we start. 2011, we start Minute with Maxwell that's literally impacted hundreds of thousands of people a year mark everywhere i go yep every i i go nowhere without people coming up and say i watch minute with maxwell yeah yep. so 2012 this we're, we got the first year under our belt and this was the year that we introduced the mentorship program yes. to john maxwell team and now we we have 42 percent of our john maxwell team certified members that joins our mentorship program why do you think mentorship is so important well, first of all, I think that percentage is really high, 42% yeah. to, to go on to a different level, which is not only you're going to learn a lot more, but it, you, it, there's a financial commitment to, to be in the mentorship program. But, but I, do know why it's a, I do know why it's a success. We've, had, we've run the mentorship program long enough now to know that that mentorship program really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, now correct me, you would know more than I would. You, you're much closer to the numbers than me. But I, 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 I would highly suspect that 95% of the people that are successful in the John Maxwell team, it would be a very high percentage, I would think, that are successful in the John Maxwell team also are in the mentorship program. That's correct. And, and there's, there's a relationship between uh, going a little further and going a little deeper and, and being more successful. And, and I think it, I think it is because of the mentoring that they get the continual mentoring. I mean, the weekly calls, yep. uh, all of the things that in the mentorship program we provide for people, it's almost like holding their hands step by step. Here's how you go to the next step. I think that combined with the fact that when they re up or they up for the mentorship program, with their time and with their money, they're also showing their commitment to really do something about it. They they want to have more than just a, a name that says I'm a John Maxwell uh, certified uh, coach. They they really want to they want to help people and make a difference and, and, and make a career and have a business. They're entrepreneurial, some yeah. of them, and and they they want to be successful. You know, and and I want to move to 2013, but I got to tell you this: in 2011, you were 64. And you were getting mentored. In 2021, you're 74. Yeah. You're still getting mentored. Totally. And what I love about mentorship, what I love about everything about John Maxwell Team, it's not a good idea that you tell other people how to do it. You live it yeah. every single yeah. day, including me. I mean, just the last couple of weeks, you've been being mentored by global leaders yeah. on how to lead in where we are today. Yeah, and and, and I, I will always have a mentor. Right. I, in fact, I can't, I can't imagine you not having a mentor. I. I cannot imagine you not having somebody that's gone before you that has experience that you don't have and knowledge that you don't have and, and advice that you need and, and not tapping into it. And so I think the John Maxwell team, the people going to mentorship program, they, they, you know, they just go deeper. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you go deeper in your experiences, you can go wider in your influence. And, and I think that's why it's been so successful. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. 